let's open Lightroom and simulate an inflow. Okay, a downloading. We've downloaded from our field unit, let's say, to our, our, to our field backup. Now we're back at the studio and we want to download from there into our main system. So because they don't have um, all these backup drives and media drives and everything else here, and I couldn't talk Celeste into buying some just for the class and taking them home myself <laughs> or giving them away to Greg after class, um, we're going to have to pretend. So opening up Lightroom in the import dialog, what I've done here, let me hide that again and show you. Um, on one of my little mobile drives, okay, I've created card three. So we'll pretend like card three is on the little mobile drive that we're just bringing in, okay? Or a card that we're dropping into our slot or something like that. I know I'm, it's a leap of faith, but just you know, work with me here. We, we have to imagine if we will. So let's go back out here. Where'd my Lightroom go? Okay, when you first open up Lightroom, it asks you the source, and I've dialed it down to card three, which is on mobile one, which would be what my other field backup drive. So this, this is normal, I would have. Um, cards one, two, three, four in there. I choose that. It shows a um, preview. And you notice with Lightroom now, we get these little movie icons, uh, which is really cool. Um, and what's even better is you can open those up and take a closer look at those. So let me go back here. So we're going to import everything, and we're just going to copy it. Now, if I'm copying it, I want to copy it to my main drive, my media drive, which is now mobile one, because we're pretending. Minimal previews, no duplicates, file renaming. Well, because we named, as you see here, 2011-0206 Jordan shoot two, card one, and this was the 10th take in that. I don't have to do any renaming. I don't have to apply anything in here. The only thing I have to do is make sure that I'm targeting the Jordan folder on my hard drive, and in there I'm targeting the raw original, and then in here I can create a new folder and just copy all that information over, or I can come down and put it into a subfolder and create that subfolder here. So um, the subfolder was 2011-02, what day was that, 06? Oh, it's right in front of me. Um, 06, and that was 2, and card 3, okay? I know they say 1, but I, I didn't have a card 3, and I, wanted to, I didn't want to mess up my system. I need to be able to take this out later on. So that's what I'm going to give it right here. Jordan 2, okay, targeting that. Do you keyword any of that? Huh? When you ingest that, do you keyword any of that at all? Well, that's what we can get to. You, if you want to at this point, you can keyword, um, which I always do. Uh, we have a, um, one of my good friends, David Ricks, who owns... Um, controlled vocabulary. If you've never played with keywords or never realized the value of keywords, go to controlledvocabulary.com. Um, the guy's going to take you to school on keywording. <laughs> Patrick's over there laughing. He's been there, and we all know David uh, throughout the photo organizations. Uh, keywording is the only way you're going to find stuff that's floating out there. You can put your ownership in there. You can put your 
information in there for editors and everything else. I'm sure as editors, we've got a couple of editors here who've looked for things on the web. How do you get found? You know, if nobody knows you're there, and one of the ways that the image database is sorted out is keywords. So I might put in here, um, whoops, speaker, his name, Jordan Malik, um, Olympian, athlete, motivational speaker, now, if I had David's library downloaded, as I started to type those things out in the controlled vocabulary library, it starts building the trees out for me. So you can have 20 or 30 related keywords, okay? You can spend a lot of time here. What I normally do is make sure that, number one, um, the images are copyrighted, that my name is in there. Number two, the subject's name. Um, the general, the gist of what we were doing here. This is a headshot, it's a motiv motivational speaker, it's a promotion, okay? Then as I get further down, the one I release is going to have a lot more information in it than that. But for my own files, um, thank God they're still small enough where I can go find things with half a dozen keywords, but uh, promotion. Could we mention the name of the website again, I'm sorry, that you were referencing? controlledvocabulary.com. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You know, it, it's funny, Greg, that two years ago when there was a stock industry, uh, before it imploded, that would have been the first thing on my mind was, was getting 20 or 30 keywords in there to make sure when I got it up there, buyers could find it. But I don't do stock anymore, so it, it's kind of going, well, it's part of my filing system now. Greg was, uh, if you don't know, Greg Probst is one of the best, uh, I don't want to say infamous, but he's one of the highly regarded panoramic photographers. If you go up to his website, you're going to see some of the most gorgeous panoramas that you've ever seen. And like I said, he's the chairman of the local American photographic artists. I'm still trying to get that name down. Uh, hey, Rick, we have a number of people asking in the chat room, um, why you're choosing to go through Lightroom and, and just kind of, the, I guess they were expecting for you to go straight to Final Cut Pro and they want a little bit more guidance as to why you'd go through Lightroom before Final Cut Pro and if you could use Aperture instead of Lightroom. Yes, Aperture will work and Aperture and Lightroom are both viable for the same reason. This is intro to Final Cut Pro for HDSLR still photographers. We all have some kind of databasing system already, okay? Yes, we're going to Final Cut Pro. Yes, we're gonna pull from this, but you still need a catalog. You still need a way to search your stuff, to look at your stuff, to archive your stuff out. Um, so doing it in Lightroom or Aperture has nothing to do with going, Final Cut Pro is not a cataloging program. It's an assembly, you know, it's a working program. I'm trying to get a good foundation set up here whether they use Lightroom, whether they use Bridge, uh, whether they use Aperture. Um, what are some of the other ones out there? iView, Photo Mechanic does filing and does motion. Okay, I can't get any of these other photographers to commit to anything. They're just throwing things out and putting it on me. The only two I'm really sure of are three would be Bridge, Lightroom, and Aperture. Okay, so after we've got everything in here, when we open up Compressor, when we open up Light, uh, Final Cut, we know where to go to find the stuff. We know where to tell F Final Cut to save the stuff. We know how to tell Compressor after we've transcoded them where to put them back so we can find them with Final Cut. So we're still down at the base of the mountain. We're building up. Okay, that helped? Okay, and so we've got them going to mobile three, we're going to their old folder, then they go ahead and import. Um, there's a couple of quick ways, 
let's just go right over because the next thing is transcoding. I want to show you the quick and dirty way, which really isn't dirty, but it's pretty quick. Um, I'd like to preview, especially on something like Jordan, where I've got, I need five shots, but I've got dozens of files. So I've got to go in and start getting familiar with them real quick. Um, I could open up Final Cut Pro. I could bring each one of them in. They haven't been transcoded. I don't want to transcode everything. I don't want to be, you know, watching compressor all evening or letting it run all night. I want to transcode my selects. Let's talk about transcoding for a second. Everybody know what transcoding is? Except for Greg. I'm, I'm, I'm going to stop picking on you. Celeste told me I couldn't do that if you showed up. Uh, <laughs> The cameras shoot in a highly compressed format. Uh, these, and I believe the Canons do also, H.264. Takes these huge amounts of information and crams them down into these, quickly crams them down into these little cards so we can transport them around, okay? When we bring them out here, the editing programs, though they theoretically can work with those, don't like those, pro those those are not editing um, codecs, as they call it. That's compressing, decompressing. Uh, the H.264 is a codec. It's a shooting codec rather than an editing codec. So what we want to do, it's sort of like a JPEG. You know, when you store a JPEG, it's like that big. But then when you open it up, it's that big and it has a lot more information, a lot more goodness to it. Well, that's what we're doing here. We're taking those H.264s and converting them into another more editor-friendly format. Uh, in this case, we're using something called ProRes 422. It's an Apple codec. It's, it's good. There's nine flavors of it. We use the middle flavor. There's a proxy flavor down at the bottom, so you can work on like just real low res versions of the movie if you're working on assembling something really big and you don't have the bandwidth and then you can go back if you have time code and you've got everything else you can work with that or high quality if you're going out to broadcast if you're going to be down at the cinema you know and you need every bit of goodness out there out of it um, you can take one of these 300k files and turn it into a 3.5 gigabyte file just by transcoding in, into high. I found that medium, their unbranded flavor, just straight 422, works well enough for just about everything I do, 99.9%. Um, .9%. Hopefully I'll get good enough where it won't be, and I'll have to you know, raise up to HQ, and I won't mind doing the bandwidth. I, I did all of that, everything in that HQ, for the first couple of months. And then I realized that I wasn't really gaining anything at my level of stuff going to the internet or going you know, to local TVs or DVD or something like that. I was degrading it even further. So the nice thing about using these programs and one of the reasons I do like it is if you want to, um, you can click on one of these See, there's my passport color checker. Um, preview it. Uh, command zero. Let me get this stop. Yeah. Well, they change this around on this one. Command zero on my version of QuickTime Player um, drops it down to half size, so you get a decent more. Um, Realistic. I guess I made it easier. Um, so you get an idea. Say, okay, this one obviously is not going to be one of my selects. It's not going to be one of the ones I transcode. So I just close it up. Let me look at another one. Um, they come down here to eight. Um, take that out. And what was that command minus now? Let's take a look at it. And 
So we got a lot of lead up. You know, one of the first things I noticed when I retired from Olympic level competition and went into business for myself was that people didn't seem to be working from a plan. Bingo. That's great. That's the best one I've heard them do so far, you know, gone through the old thing. So now I'll take those and why is everything different in this one? But it's not opening it up. It's within Lightroom. Mine opens up QuickTime 7. I'll come back and I'll open up with that um, on the next session because I do want to get out to Compressor and show you that. But the thing is, if you have QuickTime and you can open up and Lightroom normally in my workflow opens up them in QuickTime, I can export them as 422s right from there. I can also do a, a slight clip. You know, you have handles you can drag right within QuickTime Pro that will do all of this. Okay, apparently they don't have that version installed. So we'll have to upgrade that. But know that you can do that and then save it back into the transcoded folder, remember, as it goes down. The reason I numbered those folders the way I did is because that's your workflow. You, you work down through those folders.